Anyone who has a small child, as I now do, knows the words. Almost as soon as they can speak, it isn't fair! It's a gut-wrenching cry, a fundamental injury. And it puts us on the wrong side of justice, no matter how we respond. Because I say so is tyrannical. And even worse, well, the world isn't fair, thereby condemning our new human to the belief that they've been born into a prison. Human rights weren't always here. Because I say so was for centuries the bulwark of the tyrant and the king. And for centuries, people who thought it wasn't fair had no legal repost. When I directed a play about the miners' unions, Close the Coal House Door, a few years ago, perhaps the greatest lesson it taught me was that rights are won gradually, through blood, through disobedience, and through suffering, on the streets, in the courts, and over many years. The horror of the Second World War produced a collective cry of never again. It was a time for a huge vote of confidence in the human race. The treaty that established the United Nations in 1948 gives, as one of its purposes, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights. The post-war consensus in just three years gave us the UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the NHS, the Arts Council, and the National Coal Board. All of these are under threat or gone. It's not enough to say history repeats itself. We repeat it through ignorance or poor memory or lassitude, we repeat it. When this country signed the Human Rights Act in 1998, it enshrined in law for the first time the rights contained in the European Convention. Since then, rights of privacy in particular have been protected and attacked. People who could perhaps think more deeply about these things say, if I'm not doing anything wrong, I've got nothing to hide in the first place, these people should be banned from owning curtains. But they're also ignoring the fact that someone else decides when nothing becomes something. That line is always moving. And at the moment, it's moving towards us. I'm not an expert on these things, which is good, according to Michael Gove. I'm a lovey, a snowflake, a libtard, and probably in neo-Nazi terminology, a cuck, too. Though I'm fairly certain my daughter is mine. She bursts out laughing when she farts, apart from anything else, which certainly saved me the cost of a DNA test. But if I'm just a lovey, shouldn't I keep my opinions to myself? No. For one thing, I'm a tax-paying resident of this country, and I think that gives me the right to an opinion about what my government is up to, and usefully excludes several non-DOM press barons, by the way. And secondly, since the press seem to take notice of nothing but celebrity nowadays, I'm willing to do anything I can to get these ideas publicised, even if it's just because I've sometimes been on telly. It's time to show up. In theory, human rights are not privileges. They can't be granted or revoked. Everyone is born with them, and everyone's rights are the same. This would comfort my two-year-old. It's a simple idea, and it feels right. But putting it into practice is very hard. The Universal Declaration is just that, a declaration, not a law. No state observes its citizens' human rights willingly. They have to be compelled. To quote this report, what matters in turning a principle or ideal into an actual right is the extent to which people can rely on them and how they are protected by interpretation of the law. In its summary, the report says, Brexit is likely to mean challenging infringement of rights will be more difficult for UK citizens. Not perhaps the sexiest line in history, but pretty straightforward. Unless government acts to protect the rights we have, things will be harder. We have made progress, and we are now deliberately going backwards. We must mobilise against prejudice. New trustworthy statistics tell us that since the Brexit vote, hate crime of all kinds has hugely increased. There seems to be an empathy drought. Now when people speak up on behalf of child refugees, they're accused of virtue signalling. Now what you've done there, you see, is you've confused virtue signalling with virtue. Looking after children escaping from danger is actually virtuous. In fact, it's essential. As Neil Gaiman said on Channel 4 News recently after the shameful abandonment of the Dubs Amendment, we help children. 
That's what human beings do. Anyone who doesn't donate every spare bedroom to refugees is called a hypocrite, as if supporting people is only genuine if they can move in with you. But it's important to state that we are allowed to be in favour of things that we aren't able to do ourselves. As Scott Alexander tweeted recently, I think the NHS is important. Should I pop down and assist in surgery this weekend or next? I'm not prepared to become an MP, but it doesn't mean I'm against parliamentary democracy. In fact, I'm all for it. And so should we all be. Because at the moment, what the tabloids call taking back control looks more to me like ceding control to an executive not afraid to cozy up to tyrants. Freedom from torture is one of the things enshrined in Article 3 of the European Convention. I don't need to remind you that only six days into his presidency, Donald Trump praised waterboarding and said torture was absolutely effective. This despite a letter from 173 retired military officers with 6,000 years' experience between them who said it didn't work. Trump named 9-11, Boston, Orlando and San Bernardino to justify his Muslim ban. None of those attackers were from countries in the ban. This blurring of refugee and terrorist into immigrant refuses people basic humanity and begins the monstering of the other. Some of these other rings break the known laws of physics. People like Schrodinger's immigrant who lasers around on benefits while simultaneously stealing your job. I urge you to follow the Twitter account, A Human Crisis, which retweets stories about refugees replacing the word migrant with human. It described Golwali Pasale, an Afghan I interviewed last year, who came here when he was 12, as former child human. It's a really effective trick. It changes the way you think. Human rights laws and the court established by the European Commission to enact them are vital. They set standards, protect activists, journalists and whistleblowers. Anyone who knows their King Lear knows how important a whistleblower is, a licensed fool who can speak the truth to power. When the fool says to the king, thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise, the king replies, oh, let me not be mad. Not mad, sweet heaven. Keep me in temper. I would not be mad. Wisdom and maturity and parliamentary democracy are needed if we are to keep our country in temper or we will all go mad. When the Conservative Party in 2015 told us they wanted to break the formal link between British courts and the European Court of Human Rights, civil liberty advocates told us the proposed changes would, quote, erode the right to life, the right to privacy, the right to a fair trial, the right to protest, and the right to freedom from torture and discrimination. That must not happen. We must not willingly go backwards before that generation who think it isn't fair are old enough to fight for their rights themselves. All we ask is that Parliament secure the means to make challenging infringement of human rights after Brexit easier, not harder. There's a really important rule in directing. First, don't make it worse. That's what I'm asking. Let's not willingly blunder on making our country worse. If we do, never again will become your next. Thank you.